The biggest topic in Bible prophecy for those who are awake and aware is Revelation 12. Because it looks like there is a sign in the heavens in September of this year, 2017, that lines up exactly with Revelation 12, 1 and 2, which describes a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She is in labor, and she is giving birth to a male child. Once born, is immediately caught up to the throne in heaven due to the threat of a dragon who tries to devour the child as soon as it's born. This is a clear picture of the pre-tribulation rapture of the body of Messiah, the church. The rapture is a birth. That means that we are a baby. Now, prior to birth, we are in gestation. That means that prior to gestation, a conception had to take place. This is what happened at Pentecost 2,000 years ago, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And I've taught on that over the last year. I have so much information about this. I've studied this so deeply over the last year that for the most part, I, I almost don't know where to start a lot of times making videos because it's, it's secular. Everything is connected to everything else. So I have a hard time knowing where to start and where to end. I'm going to try to give you some information that I've been sitting on for a long, long time. A lot of this I have brought forth. As you know that I, I made a video where I was in my truck last, um, last summer and I told you what was on my heart. I told you that I had discovered some amazing things and I have had to untie some knots. Uh, th th there's things that we've been told in Christianity, in Christendom, that are totally false and backwards. One of those is that the church was born at Pentecost. And I've cleared that up in some of my other videos. A lot of my subscribers have understood this now. That has been completely been misunderstood, and it's in countless books, countless sermons. People still say that the church was born at Pentecost. It was not born at Pentecost. It was conceived at Pentecost. This is a birth story which relates to the natural of how a real baby comes into being. You've got to have a father. You've got to have a mother. The mother has an egg. The father has a seed. The seed enters into the egg, and then a new creation is formed with its own DNA. And we are, Paul says, a new creation. It's a birth story that has never been accurately told because Revelation 12, the rapture in Revelation 12 was never understood. How many births are there? Is the rapture a birth? But also at Pentecost, the beginning of the church was also a birth? No. When somebody is saved, is that a birth? Is that a second birth born again? The Father led me to answer my questions on these things. And I've real, there's, out of those three, Pentecost being a birth, salvation being a birth, and the rapture being a birth, only one can be true because you can only be born in, one, in a, one birth story. There's only one birth. You've got to get, you've got to get the timeline of a birth correct. All you ladies out there, you know. The fertilization of your egg is the first thing that takes place. And then a gestation period of growth of the baby, and then the birth is the end of, of the story, of, of the birth story. So I'm, I've been sitting on so much information here in the last year or so in, in deeply discovering this story. I'm going to try to tell you a few things here today. And everything I'm going to share with you is not new to me, but it's going to be new to you because I haven't put it all out in video form. A lot of this I have told to a lot of friends on the phone and when I Skype with people and uh, talk to them, there's countless people who know this information in the background, but I haven't put it in, in, in video form yet. But I, I want to open up some things here and we're going to talk about the rapture and the tribulation period because it is connected to this birth story all over the scriptures. Let's begin. The best place to start is at the end, because in my research, what I did, once I understood Revelation 12 correctly, the characters, 
which is of epic importance, you have to understand that this child is not the Messiah being born. That already happened. This is a future prophecy. This is his body. In Colossians 1.18, it says that he is the head, but we are the body. He's in two parts right now. The head is already at the throne. The body is on earth, but we have to go to the throne. That's what happens when the birth happens. Revelation 12, 5, Revelation 12, 5, the child is born and caught up to the throne. That is the same thing as the rapture as we meet him in the clouds and then we go to be with him forevermore. The head meets the body. That needs to take place. Hasn't happened yet. I'll read Revelation 12. We'll just get that foundation and then I'm going to reverse engineer some things. You're going to want to stick with this. I can't tell you everything. Um, if you're confused about some things, you have some question. Who is the dragon? Uh, I have a video on the dragon. Uh, a lot of people ask me that in the, in the comments. Just go check my channel and go back and research if you're interested in this. I've got more videos on this than anybody on YouTube spanning all the way back six years. So check out the videos. Just watch everything. And the stuff in the last year is more accurate because that's when I had to make some changes in my own thinking. Revelation 12, 1 and 2. And a great sign was seen in the Shamaim, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And being pregnant, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. I'll also let you know that I'll be reading from the Hallelujah Scriptures, which accurately changes some words and gets a little Hebrew on you, but that's the language that they spoke back then. When I say Shamaim, that means heavens, all three of them. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. That means there's at least three heavens. So, it's always plural. The English gets it wrong and makes it singular. Shamaim. This is heavens. And then it says, Another sign was seen in the Shamaim, and a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And his tail draws a third of the stars of the Shamaim and throws them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore... She gave birth to a male child, a son, who was to shepherd all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to Elohim and to his throne. We'll leave it there uh, at, at verse 5. My error was believing books that I have read. So many books have said that this is just the virgin birth that happened 2,000 years ago. It's not. It's another virgin birth, as shown in the heavens. The child is the church being born. Questions that people have about, but he has an iron rod. So obviously in the Psalms, Yahweh gave his son the iron rod to rule and reign with. But in the church age chapters, in Revelation 2, 26 and 27, the Messiah who now has an iron rod he also gives that authority to his own body. How natural. In the same way that a sheriff dep deputizes other men, he deputizes us. He gives his body, the church, the iron rod. And that's why this baby has an iron rod to rule and reign with, to shepherd the nations with, as we are to be kings and priests in the millennium period, to rule and reign with him. This is the who the child is. So the woman is Israel. The child is the church being born and raptured to the throne. And then the dragon is Satan, but he has seven heads, which represents seven kingdoms. You can also liken this to um, the new world order because he controls the systems of this world. Now we'll flip all the way back to the first page of the Bible. Genesis 1, 14. This is creation. And Elohim said, let lights come into the expanse of the Shamaim to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and for years. So he put the lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, which are wandering stars. They also reflect light of the sun. They are lights in the heavens from our perspective. He put them up there for signs, first page of the book, and for appointed times. You might have a translation here in Genesis 1.14 that says, and for seasons. And so you might be misled to think winter, spring, summer, fall. Not true. Not the case. The Hebrew word is moadim, 
Again, ending with the I am like Shamayim makes it plural in the Hebrew. Moedim is the appoint the appointed times, the festivals. Leviticus 23 gives us seven festivals of which are of epic importance that you must understand to understand Bible prophecy. You must understand them. Let's go over them because epic things have happened on them because they are prophecies to be fulfilled. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. The first four of these festivals have been fulfilled twice so far. You know that in the, day, in the days of Messiah, he died at Passover, he went into the tomb on unleavened bread, he rose from the dead three days later on the Feast of First Fruits, and then the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, came down at Pentecost and conceived a new creation, the body of Messiah. This also happened at the Exodus. The Jews were instructed to put lamb's blood on their door so that the spirit of death would pass over them. That was Passover. All who didn't, their firstborn died. This is just what happened at the cross. The firstborn died. The very next day, the day that Messiah would go into the tomb, the firstborn would go into the tomb, all of those in Egypt, the Egyptians, were burying their dead. Who were who? Their firstborn. And that day also, the Jews left Egypt in haste, and they didn't have time to leaven their bread, which means put yeast in their bread to make it rise. So it's the day of unleavened bread, fulfilled twice. They're burying their firstborn, and the Jews left in haste and couldn't leaven their bread. And then we see in Numbers that the Jews, on, during their escape, they camped for three days in the wilderness. And then they crossed over the Red Sea on dry land on first fruits, which would then be the resurrection of the Messiah. And then they got to Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia by the time it was Pentecost, 50 days later. And then Elohim came down on the mountain in, in smoke and fire and with the sound of a, of, a, of a trumpet, which is the first trump, fulfilling Pentecost. So twice, twice, the first four have been fulfilled, both with the Exodus and then with the gospel. But the last three have not been fulfilled yet and must be fulfilled because each one, the pattern is already complete. These festivals are being fulfilled precisely to the very day, which means the Feast of Trumpets must be fulfilled precisely to the very day, atonement to the very day, and tabernacles to the very day. Back to the heavens, Psalm 19 clearly says that the Shamayim, they proclaim the esteem of Elohim, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, meaning audibly, and there are no words. Their voice, audibly, is not heard, but their line has gone out through all of the earth, and their words to the end of the world. He's talking about signs in the heavens. His heavens, the sun, moon, stars, planets, they tell us something, but only if we're wise enough to decipher it correctly. The wise men who deciphered correctly the birth of the Messiah were led by a sign in the heavens. We know it as the Star of Bethlehem, which was the movement of stars during a particular period that ended up at the Feast of Trumpets. September 11th, 3 BC was the birthday of the Messiah, the Feast of Trumpets. So, in other words, the Feast of Trumpets has been fulfilled in a certain way there by his birth. But in the same way that it was fulfilled twice, the Exodus and the Gospel, the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled by the body of Messiah being born and caught up to the throne. In the same way that the head, Colossians 1.18, again, He's the head, we're the body. Two parts. Two parts. Never forget that. 
He's the head, we're the body. The head was born in the Feast of Trumpets, therefore the body would be born in the Feast of Trumpets. The head and the body always have the same birthday. But it is a sign in the heavens. It is the stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the heavens, that declare births. Most people don't know this, but the most important people, the most important figures of history and the future are born with signs in the heavens. As the star of Bethlehem, we know that the Messiah was born and there was, the, and the heavens declared his birthday. But something happened even before that to prior to the Messiah, the most epic person that lived, the most important person that lived, the father of Israel was born with the sign in the heavens. Now, this isn't in, isn't in the canon, but it is in the book of Jasher or the book of Yashar. Let me just tell you a little bit about this story. Yashar 7, 8, and 9 tell a story. It's the birth of Abraham. But before Abraham, his name was Abram. His name was later changed to Abraham. In the same way, his son Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. But listen to this. Abram's father was named Terah, and he was a sovereign in the household of Nimrod the man who built the Tower of Babel. And he, was, he is a forepicture of, of the Antichrist trying to take over the world. It says that Terah took a wife and her name was Amthelo. And the wife of Terah conceived and bore him a son in those days, during the days of the Tower of Babel. Terah was 70 years old when he brought him forth. The numbers mean something. I won't go into that right now. And Terah came, called the name of his son that was born to him, Abram. And it came to be in the night that Abram was born that all the servants of Terah and all the wise men of Nimrod and his astrologers, those watching for signs in the heavens, came and ate and drank in the house of Terah, the father of Abram, and they rejoiced with him on that night. It was the celebration of the birth of Abraham, of, of Abram, who would then be the father of, of Israel. And then when all the wise men and astrologers went out from the house of Terah, they lifted up their eyes towards the Shammaim that night to look at the stars. That's what they did. They're astrologers and lo looking for signs in the heavens, seeing what the heavens are doing. And they looked and see one very large star came from the east and it ran in the Shamaim and it swallowed up the four stars from the four sides of the Shamaim, north, south, east, and west. And all the wise men of the sovereigns and the astrologers were astonished at the sight. And the wise men understood this matter and they knew its importance. And they said to each other, this foretells the child that has been born to Terah this night will grow up and be fruitful and multiply and possess all of the earth. He and his children forever and he and his seed will slay great sovereigns and inherit their lands. If you continue reading that story, it actually, there's a parallel to both Revelation 12, the body of Messiah being born, to the threat of, of a dragon, but escaping, and also how Herod went after to try to kill the Messiah as well. Nimrod asked Terah, actually told Terah, I will pay for your child, just give him to me. And long story short, 
what happened was Terah took one of his handmaiden's children and gave that child, protecting his own child, Abram, gave that child to Nimrod and Nimrod threw the child and dashed his head to the floor, to the ground. And he thought that he had killed Abram because Nimrod felt a threat based on what the wise men told him. And so he tried to kill. He tried to kill Abram, but didn't get him. So the seed of Abram, his name changed to Abraham, would then become the nation of Israel. He was the father through Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Jacob had 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. So Abram was of epic importance. And then you have the Messiah who was born. And then after that, you've got the church, the body of Messiah, born. All three have the same stories. They've got wise men, astrologers, a sign in the heavens, a birth of someone of epic importance. I don't think you know who you are, church. (laughs) And in the 7,000-year timeline that we are in, each one of these took place at about the 2,000-year mark. About 2,000 years from Adam, Abram was born. About 2,000 years from Abram, the Messiah was born. And about 2,000 years from the Messiah, the church is born and caught up into heaven. All due to the threat of someone, a sovereign, someone who was mighty, someone who was evil, tries to kill us. Every time failing, but every time with wise men, astrologers, a birth, and and a sovereign seeking to destroy the one who was born and failing. Three times, friends. If you are in the body of Messiah, if you are a believer and you have the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit inside of you, you are destined to be born again a second time this time of incorruptible seed. And you are of epic importance as the sign, as the pattern shows. If I read to you 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved ones, now we are children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone having this expectation in him cleanses himself, and he is clean. This is the rapture. And if we have the expectation of the rapture, it's because we are in him and he is in us, and we are saved by his blood, which makes us clean. But it's still a mystery as to the epic importance of who we are in the reign of heaven. But Matthew, in Matthew, it gives us a clue. You've probably seen pictures, so many people have painted pictures of of Jesus with little kids around him, or he's got a kid on his lap or something like that. And that is Matthew 18, which I'm going to read to you. However, I don't think it's been properly interpreted. I'm going to show you what it really means. At that time, the disciples came to Yeshua, Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the reign of the Shamaim? Who is the greatest in the reign of heaven? And Yeshua called a little child to him and put him in their midst. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. The church was not conceived at this point. He's talk, Even though he's talking to the disciples, he's still talking to them as Jews because they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. The, the, the new creation of the body of Christ didn't occur until he was gone. This happened at Pentecost. So in reality, he's talking to them in their fleshly nature, not their spiritual nature. He's talking to them in their flesh, fleshly nature, which is of the seed of Abraham. So they're Israelites. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn... Some, some translations say become converted, which of course, th- what he's doing is he's prophesying here of what will take place later. Unless you turn and become as little children, 
you shall by no means enter into the reign of the Shamaim. Whoever then humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the reign of the Shamaim. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that he has a millstone hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. So who's the little one? It's the new creation. It's us as a baby. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. He's prophesying here. Some people have interpreted this as just meaning just, you know, become humble, have faith like a child and all that. No, it's deeper than that. To humble yourself means to get on your knees and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. (laughs) That's what this means. And then he tells them, as Jews in in their fleshly nature, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in the Shamaim, their messengers always see the face of my father who is in the Shamaim. For the son of Adam, he's talking about himself, has come to save what was lost. Who's he talking to? Jews. He's trying to save the Jews. And this goes back to Matthew 15, 24, which tells us of his, the imperative of his ministry. Matthew 15, 24 says, and he answering said, I was not sent except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His mission was to come and prove to the Jews that the Father had sent him as their Messiah, which was prophesied. Overall, the Israelites didn't believe, but some did, and became the body of Christ, the body of Mashiach. But he's talking to the Jews here. And then also in Matthew 19, 14, Yeshua says, Allow the young children, do not stop them from coming to me, for such is the reign of the Shamaim. That's us coming to him. And we are the greatest, he says, in the reign of the Shamaim, in the, in the reign of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. We are the greatest, of course, underneath him. It's believing now in the church age that makes you the greatest in the reign of the Shamaim, that makes you the greatest in heaven. Because it is by belief that he cleanses us and that makes you faithful instead of having to see to believe you have faith to believe and that is of epic importance without faith it is impossible to please elohim and that is what makes you the greatest so abram great messiah great and the body of christ he's the head and we're the body how could the body not be great as well We certainly are, friends. And he gave us a sign in the heavens on our birthday to prove it, just like the other two. In closing, let me just give you one more nugget that I think that you'll enjoy very much. Uh, And I'm going to have to actually make another video because I I didn't even get to the point that I was trying to get to. And I realize that this is already longer than I like. Um, We talked about Paul being caught up to the third heaven. And remember, the rapture is our birthday, our second birthday when we're born again. Everyone has been born in this corrupted flesh because of what Adam and Eve did, but we have to be born a second time to go in. We have to become like like little children. That's what, that's what he said, Messiah said in Matthew. We have to be converted and we have to become as little children. It's a complete do-over. It's a complete do-over. we are got to become a baby again, innocent, one more time. So when we are caught up, he can hold us and and look at us like an innocent child that's never sinned. And we will be be made clean. We will be made completely clean, flesh and, and all. That's the rapture. That's how we are changed, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. We have to be changed from this corruptible to incorruptible. That's the only way that we can go to heaven. Paul was caught up to heaven. And I want to show you this. The, 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 re, the way that Paul got some of its, so much of his information that he was able to teach the church is because I believe he was, he was like downloaded. He went to heaven and he, and he was 
told all kinds of unspeakable things, things that he wasn't able to teach us, but also the things that he did teach us. And of course, he was the one that revealed the rapture. Let me read to you about what happened to him. In, in 2 Corinthians 12, he's talking sort of in the, in the third, he's talking about himself. He's talking in, in the second person, I guess, or in the third person. He's talking to someone about himself. And he says, I know a man in Mashiach who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or whether out of the body, I, I do not know, Elohim knows, such a one, he's talking about himself, such a one was caught up to the third Shamaim. That word caught up in the Greek original is harpazo, the same word that's in Revelation 12, 5 about our birth being born straight into the throne room. And I know such a man, whether the body or out in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Elohim knows that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not right for a man to speak. He's talking about his conversion. He was caught up, harpazo, raptured into heaven. Now we'll go over to 1 Corinthians 15, and he tells what the experience is like. What's happening here is he's, he's saying that Messiah was revealed to, to certain people after the Messiah was raised again, and he was in his new body of flesh and bone, without blood or water, and he appeared to people. And this is the gospel which you, you need to understand. I'll just, I'll just read it all. You need to become saved. You need to believe that this is all true. He is the Messiah that will save you. Brothers, I make known to you the good news. This is the gospel, which I brought as good news to you, which you also received, in which you stand, through which also you were being saved. If you hold fast to that word I brought as good news to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you at the first that which I also received. This is his conversion. That Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And here's where he talks about who, who saw the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And that he was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brothers at one time, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. By the time he was writing this, some of those people had died. After that, he was seen by Jacob, and then by all the emissaries. He's, he's saying that he was raised from the dead, and it's proven there are witnesses. And then he says, and last of all, he was seen by me also. Now get this. As if to one born prematurely. What did he just say? He said that when he, when Messiah appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he was caught up somehow into the third heaven. He felt like he was born prematurely. Why? Because he was. That happened almost 2,000 years ago. But the birth of whom he is inside of the body of Christ, that doesn't happen until, well, the sign in Revelation 12. It says that's a birthday sign. And the birth is there. That, that doesn't happen until the future. But he said that when he was caught up to heaven, he felt like it was a premature birth. Because it was. Because the body of Christ hasn't been born yet. That is amazing. And it's also proof that our birth is the rapture being caught up to the throne room in heaven. So many people are asking me whether I think the rapture is this September. Listen, I hope so. I don't know. I don't have a time-traveling device to go over there and come back and tell you. 
But the bottom line is that there are patterns that are set up. The festivals must be fulfilled in chronological order. The Feast of Trumpets is next, which has everything to do with the, the rapture. If you study that, that out, there's, there's videos on my channel about that if you want more information about that. The Feast of Trumpets is the festival of the rapture. And this sign happens at the time of the Feast of Trumpets this year. And there is no other sign in the future. I have been there in my astronomy program for thousands of years. There is no other sign that can match Revelation 12, 1 and 2, which describes the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the constellation Virgo as being the woman. There is no other sign. But the pattern, the other pattern is already established, that these epic birthdays happen with signs in the heavens. It, there is so much more to this. There is so much more to this. Please subscribe now if you haven't. Because more is coming, more is coming, and get caught up on what I've already done. The videos are there. So much work has been, do has been done for free for you, and most of them without commercials. The only time that there's a commercial or an ad or something on my video is when I cover somebody else's song or, or I'm using some music in a song that's copyrighted. Other than that, I make nothing from this. So you don't even have to worry about that garbage worldly advertisements on a ministry. Just go watch them. After this, click on the screen, click below in the about section. There's links down there. And go to my click on my name, Scott Clark, and go to my webpage. Go to go to my my channel and look at the topics that you're interested in. You want to know who the dragon is in Revelation 12? I've got that. You want to know more about Feast of Trumpets? I've got that. Just go. It's all It's all the work's being done. It's all free for you. And thank you so much for those of you who have, who have supported me. I just, I can't thank you enough. You know who you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it encourages me to keep going because this is not, not easy to do. And I will see you in the next video. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Last night I looked into the sky moon turned to blood before my eyes and i said father send another sign open up their eyes while there's still time